Chapter 51 You are listening at NovelFull.audio Reaper Scans Chapter 51 The Controlled Beast, T.L. Osaka, P.R. Ash, the place where Brady died was around two miles from Svanther. Letho, Roy, and Cassius walked down the village's path for half an hour, and saw a dense pine forest from far away. Most of the trees were over a hundred years old and over forty feet tall. When they looked up, big branches and leaves resembling umbrellas congregated, blocking out the sun. The ground was also covered by a layer of said branches and leaves, and the smell of soil and remnants of fermenting plants wafted through the air. A small creature would pop out to look at them at times and scurry back into the forest after that. The crime scene is up ahead, you too, and there's dried blood left. I trust you'll see it right away. This is as far as I'll go, but I'll wait for you here. According to Cassius, going to places where people had died was unlucky. Bad luck would befall those who went there. He'd come here once, and he didn't want to come close a second time. Roy and Letho didn't force him. Far away, at the edge of the pine forest, a few especially long branches from the trees bent inward in a circle, forming a tower that measured one man tall, and beneath them, the ground filled with leaves was colored red. Flies danced above the pieces of meat and bones. Fortunately, there was no rain for the past three days, so the scene was preserved. When they went closer, they saw that the ground was filled with footprints presumably belonging to the villagers. There was also a lingering stench in the air. When they took another step, a soft murmur was heard in the quiet forest. Shocked, Roy curled up and backed off to where Letho was. He wasn't being a coward. It was merely a tactical retreat. Since Letho was around, there was no need for him to be in the vanguard. Relax, boy. Letho touched his necklace and stopped it from vibrating. The disturbance is too weak. It's not an attack. Just resonance from remnants of mana. He closed his eyes and felt it. It's been three days, but I can still feel a weak disturbance in the air. So the murderer isn't human. Roy hunkered down and touched the place where the tower dot shaped branches connected to the ground, then he blew the sand away from his hand. This tower isn't natural or built by humans. It's caused by supernatural spells. I can see how the kill happened. Brady must have been caught off guard and pierced by the spear that suddenly showed up and been thrusted into the air, slicing his belly open. So this is where he died. Roy asked I don't think anyone would destroy a corpse deliberately. Roy didn't question Letho's answer. When he walked around the scene, he found another clue. There's some weird scratches on this tree. Letho took a look and fell into silence before giving Roy a look of approval. This is the trace of getting pulled by vines. The murderer coiled Brady with vines, lifted him into the air, and killed him with a spell. They then found a part of the vine in a nearby bush. Controls vines and uses ground spikes, Roy was reminded of a monster, and he had a guess of what the murderer was. Letho hunkered down and picked up a piece of a fetid item without fear, and Roy scrunched his nose. Rotten flesh and animal feces. To be precise, bird and wolf feces as well as dried urine, but the amount is unusual. Aside from the crimson hue on the ground, there were clumps of dried feces lying around, and Letho kept on explaining. One corpse can't attract that many beasts. The body was found at the edge of the forest, while wolves should be living in the center of the forest. It's still a distance away. These aren't their hunting grounds. Roy gave it some thought. So the beasts left their excrements here on purpose. Letho nodded. Most probably. They're using excrements to hide and destroy any evidence that could point to the murderer, and they did it. The murderer's scent and tracks are mixed in. Letho rubbed his nose. At least I can't dis. I mean, trace it. Roy's question was answered. So the murderer can control animals too. He sorted out his information and arrived at a conclusion. A monster that can control vines and use ground spikes. 
has the ability to control animals and lives in the mountains. A gigantic monster popped up in his mind. If that's the murderer, then this request is going to be a hard one. But he was also excited. Hunting the monster on its turf would be an insurmountable challenge. He'd run away if he was alone, for he was weak. But since Letho was there, he had a heavy hitter which made everything possible. Letho didn't realize what Roy was thinking, and he went on with his reasoning. Don't you think this is weird, boy? The murderer didn't need to do so much if they were just dealing with normal guys. Humans and dwarves can't see their traces, unlike witchers. Roy gasped. So they did this as a countermeasure against witchers. Letho nodded solemnly. It probably just moved here recently and started murdering all it liked. Obviously, it also knew it would eventually attract professionals. This is one experienced, cunning opponent we're facing. Letho emphasized the last line, and he didn't hide his aversion either. Roy's breathing got quicker at that point. Up until that day, the grave hag had been the strongest monster he'd faced. If he managed to get a hundred EXP by killing a monster the witchers had weakened, killing a monster even a witcher was reluctant to face would provide even more EXP. I'm currently at level 3, 5 slash 1500. Not going to let this go if I can. Why are you so excited, boy? Shouldn't you be scared? The target's obviously a monster far beyond what you can handle. Letho brushed the fetid sludge from his hand and stood up. Sorry for getting your hopes up for nothing. I'm not going to take this request. Roy sighed silently. He had a feeling Letho would do that, since he was a cautious witcher. How should we explain this to everyone in Svanther? He felt a bit heartbroken when he imagined the looks of disappointment on the kids' and women's faces. What explanation? We didn't take the request or make any promises, so we owe them nothing. Are you saying you're going to fight that thing because you sympathize with them? Letho lectured him coldly. You're too weak to show pity to anyone. Roy wanted to say something, but he couldn't. He didn't expect Letho to be that caustic, but he didn't retort. The thing he should have been doing at the moment was growing and getting stronger. Squabbles wouldn't do him any good. Letho looked ahead sharply, and a raven had appeared out of nowhere on the ancient branches. It opened its wings, and its beak looked like a scythe, its black eyes having an uncannily cruel gleam to it. Seemingly surprised by the attention Letho and Roy gave it, its eyes flashed crimson and flew toward the forest. Letho mumbled, the loyal servant is now going to inform its master, huh? And then a crossbow bolt soared through the sky. The raven trembled for a moment before falling to the ground, dead. Ha! Huh. Who told you to shoot it, boy? Sorry. Did I misread you? Roy shrugged. I'll check with you next time. Join our Discord to chat about the series and get notified when a new chapter gets released. BL.net Chapter 52 You are listening at NovelFull.audio Reaper Scans Chapter 52 Dwarf Sentry, TL Osaka, PR, Ash once they'd checked the place, they went back and said their goodbyes to Cassius, much to the chief's chagrin. They were almost at their wit's end, and if the witcher they'd waited so fervently for were to leave, their village would be doomed. I thought we had a deal, Letho. I can raise the price if it's too difficult for you. Letho crossed his arms and retorted mercilessly, think harder. I said I'd make my decision after the survey. And now I've decided to refuse. This isn't just about the price. There's no point in making that much money if we're going to end up dead. Hunting requests are businesses, and they follow the rule of trade. You have the right to make requests, and we have the right to refuse them. Don't you feel any sympathy? For Tina, for Jim, for that widow, and the victim's families. Cassius frowned, and he started to beg. Can't you help them catch the murderer? But he saw no sign of pity on Letho's face, and he stopped. Instead, his eyes filled with malice, and his attitude took a turn for the worse. It's just as they said. 
Witchers are cold blooded animals who have lost all humanity. Get out of the village and never come back. This place doesn't welcome you. Letho wasn't the least bit phased by the resentment, and it wasn't the first time Roy had encountered such harsh treatment. After the grave had been killed, Kair's villagers had turned their hatred toward the witchers. And then Cassius was the second one. He wanted to chase them out the moment Letho refused to enter a contract. If we were cat school witchers, we might have just flown into a rage and killed everyone here. O.org he shook his head, the last of his pity disappearing. Roy could understand why most witchers kept a poker face on at all times. They're numb after seeing all these incidents happen over and over again. They ignored Cassius' look of rage and went toward the Mahakams. Letho, would you have turned that down if I were as strong as you? Don't think too much about it, boy. You'll have a chance to fight it in the future, but for now, focus on the trial, Letho answered. Oh, and you killed its messenger just now, so pray that it doesn't come for us. They weren't ambushed after leaving Svanthor. Not long after that, they followed the path leading to the depths of the Mahakams. The path was flanked by crags as tall as the eye could see, and its surface formed stairs of stone. Letho and Roy journeyed for around an hour when they arrived at a clearing, and they heard voices. What greeted them was two rows of barricades made from sharpened wood, blocking them from entering the forest. Behind the barricade stood a dwarf in silver armor and a big, black hammer was on his back. He was talking to his equally heavily armored comrades. A dwarf crossbowman was standing sentry, looking around for any dangers. The crossbow he held was bigger and heavier than Gabriel, the hand crossbow Roy kept in his inventory. It was like comparing a model to the real thing. Roy was excited to see that. When he was about to say something, the sentry saw them. This is not a place where outsiders can enter. Leave, travelers. The dwarf aimed his crossbow at them, and the languid dwarf with the hammer was alerted. He held the great hammer in his hand, his face contorted. The M. Mahakams D. D. O. Not welcome strangers. I. If your destination is Elander, T. Then go through Rivia or Upper Sodden in the south. The dwarf who stuttered was holding a hammer bigger than his body, and the hammer's head was bigger than his own. His short height made him look funny with the weapon, but the hammer wasn't to be taken lightly. Inertia alone would make it easy for it to crush human bones and mash bodies to a pulp. So Seville calls this a small hurdle. They don't even let anyone through. Roy was annoyed. If they followed the route the dwarves told them about, their journey time would double. Letho gave him a look and left the talking to him. He seemed to understand that his fierce looks didn't help in diplomacy. Roy organized his words and went up as calmly as he could. Brothers, W. We ain't your brothers. The stammering guard interrupted him. Get back. He took another step forward, his beard swinging toward them, and the weird smell of alcohol and sweat drifted to them. Roy took a step back. Warrior, we aren't your enemies. I have Seville's, his eyelid twitched, and alarm bells rang in his head thanks to his sharp perception. However, his body wasn't quick enough to react. A moment later, an arrow struck the stone beside him and deflected toward the wall. It was a warning shot. Roy tensed up and took another step back. Letho was faster. He quickly drew an inverted triangle in the air with his right hand, and a yellowish barrier of light covered him. Letho had nothing to fear after casting Quen. He unsheathed his steel sword, holding it at his side with both hands, pointing the tip at the dwarf's neck, looking like a bull that was going to charge its enemies. Tension was in the air, and everyone felt suffocated. Stubborn oafs. Roy showed his hands and took a step back. Don't rush this, Letho. Let's take a few steps back. He'd seen how cruel Letho could be. If he was facing harmless civilians, he'd take their insults, but he showed no mercy to those who tried to fight him. The last group to do so had died. Yeah, their attitude is shit, but you don't have to kill them. And this is their turf. 
if you kill them, that's going to offend everyone. As if we could pass through the mountains then. Letho thought about it silently and gave all the dwarves a murderous glare, and then he stabbed downward. Before anyone knew it, the sword penetrated the stone ground like it was nothing, shocking the dwarves. R. R. Retreat, the stammering dwarf stuttered meekly as he put his hammer down. He looked at his companions, whose faces were stiff, and when they shared a glance, their gusto from before gone. Roy took the chance to take out the letter and bellowed, we're friends of Seville Hoger. He wrote this letter himself. Please take a look. The dwarves heaved a sigh of relief after hearing that. Letho really scared them. C. Come here. Not you, Baldi. A few moments later, the stammering dwarf took the letter with his pudgy hands, and when he was about to read it, someone smacked his head. He turned around angrily only to get scolded. You're illiterate, you dolt. Sorry you had to see that. Dwarves are smart, but sometimes idiots are born. The crossbowman came down from the watchtower. Ignoring his furious companion, he took the letter and read it. H.M., this is Mr. Seville's handwriting and stamp all right. He nodded and handed the letter back. There was no enmity in his gaze anymore, though he still looked scared while facing Letho. That was a misunderstanding. It is our fault. Forgive us for this show of discourtesy. He tossed his hostility aside and bowed to Letho and Roy. His companion scrambled to do the same. It's nothing. I've heard of the straightforward attitude of the dwarves. Your passion for duty really opens my eyes though, Roy said, complimenting them, and just as the dwarves were feeling nice about themselves, he pulled out something from his shirt and uncorked the bottle. A moment later, the strong aroma of alcohol appeared before them, and they craned their necks, gulping, looking like cats drawn to fish. The stammering dwarf's eyes widened in disbelief. Why that your s dot shirt is s dot s o s dot small, so w dot where d dot did you g dot get that? Irrelevant question. This is a gift from Mr. Seville for us to enjoy on our journey. Fifty dot year dot old Mahakaman liquor, and it packs a punch not unlike dwarven liquor. Roy looked at Letho, and Letho was watching quietly with his arms crossed. Roy continued. But I'm going to share it with all of you as friends. What do you think? Reagan Dalba, the dwarf with the crossbow on his back, declined. Um. Mr. Seville's friend is a friend of all Mahakaman dwarves. It's normal for friends to share some alcohol, but we have a duty to carry out, so we must decline for now. Roy swirled the bottle, making the aroma waft through the air quicker, and he sized up the dwarves again. I heard dwarves are great drinkers. All of you look strong, so I bet you can drink a lot. One bottle of Mahakaman liquor isn't enough to fill you up, much less affect your job. Of course, the stammering dwarf said, agreeing, and his companions were obviously tempted by the liquor as well, but Reagan was still hesitating. Roy pulled his hand back. I won't force you if you don't want to. I shall be keeping this for the journey to enjoy alone. Hold on. Reagan finally couldn't hold his urge in, and he grabbed Roy's hand with his hairy one. You're right, Roy. This won't be enough to affect our job. Half an hour later, the guards paid the price for underestimating the wine. The bearded dwarves were taken out by the alcohol and slept on the barricade. Then Roy positioned them so they looked like two kissing pairs of dwarves. After that, he fiddled with the beautiful crossbow and ring he took from the crossbowman. The body and string were made of high dot quality material. As he held it, the weight gave him a solid feeling. A row of words were carved neatly onto the body. It read, To my dear brother, Reagan Dalba. Roy was overjoyed. He'd been looking for a chance to replace Gabriel, and he found it. A perfect weapon needs to be triggered by a ring. This is the price for the liquor, Mr. Reagan. Once I get past the Mahakams and get through the trial, I'll come back and drink with you when I have the chance. Equivalent exchange, am I right, Letho? 
Roy's frustration from being condemned by Cassius was suddenly gone. It's a long trip. Gotta find some fun. Letho shook his head and went on with the journey. Join our Discord to chat about the series and get notified when a new chapter gets released. Chapter 53 You are listening at NovelFull.audio Reaper Scans Chapter 53 Mount Carbon, TL Osaka, PR, Ash, Mount Carbon, the hometown of the dwarves, the miracle fortress of the valley. Sunlight shone on its peak, its windows caressed by snow, its walls covered by steel and fire, and the air was filled with the scent of honey and pine oil. Well, this is some shit luck. Instead of getting our murderer, we got a whole group of armed dwarves. Letho and Roy were captured by the dwarves not long after they got through the sentry. There was a big group of crossbowmen waiting for them, and the sheer number overwhelmed the duo. Seville's letter wasn't of any use, or to be more precise, it worked against them. Roy sighed, and he followed the dwarves into the forest. More than two hours later, he felt the temperature drop drastically, the trees around him covered in silvery snow. And then they were led into a valley. Dwarves were frolicking around in the plaza, and sitting behind it was the destination of their journey, Mount Carbon. I believe introductions are necessary here, Witcher. What you see here is Mahakam's capital, the fortress of the dwarves, and the sanctuary of the ancient race, Mount Carbon. Roy was shaken to his core at the sight of the gigantic fortress. Mount Carbon was embedded within the mountain, and it was made up of a main fortress shaped like a cauldron, sixteen small forts, and countless towers. The building's exterior was grayish dot white, and was made out of cement. The walls were covered with a black steel shell over a hundred feet tall. It looked ancient and indestructible, like a beast slumbering in the dark. If it were to awaken, devastation would follow. Roy didn't remember the dwarves having any fortress like that, but there it was. When he looked up at the cracks between the forts, he saw thousands of small caves in the mountain, and countless dwarves were going around, providing nutrients for Mount Carbon, just like how worker ants would. Well, at least it's a nice thing to see. We'll let your scheme slide this time then, Seville. The letter was a pass and a letter of recommendation. They managed to fool the gullible ones, but not the ones in the Mahakams. Thanks to Seville's praise, they were cordially invited to visit Mount Carbon. And they had to settle the dwarves' problem too. Letho looked the slightest bit curious, for it was rare to see such a great building, even after years of working as a witcher. Behind them followed dozens of crossbowmen aiming at them. Even though witchers were skillful, that many crossbowmen could still take them out easily, and the siege weapons looming over them didn't seem to be for show. Please forgive us for the offense. The dwarf who spoke was Kerwin Hoger, Brovar Hoger's nephew. His armor was slightly covered in snow, but his hair was whiter than that. Because of the color of his hair and beard, he looked much older than he actually was. He had a hard expression, and he talked with arrogance and superiority, something that was rarely seen among dwarves. Unlike most dwarves who braided their beards, Kerwin tied it with a silver ribbon. It was daring, but also rebellious. Roy had sharply perceived Kerwin's enmity toward him the moment they'd met. He wondered if that enmity was only directed toward him, or if it was aimed at humans as a whole. Follow me, please. They went into the fortress, passing through the front gates that were filled with spikes, and a heatwave assailed them. Roy felt as if he went from the Arctic to a volcano, and sweat poured, then what he saw shocked him. Hundreds of half-dot-naked dwarves were flanking the hall, wearing nothing but aprons. Metallic sounds clanged out as the dwarves swung their hammers on the steel on their workstations. Flames soared, and the dwarves' shadows were cast onto the wall, and it looked as if dark giants were swinging their arms. A short while later, Roy's attention was brought to the scene beside him. Inside the flames of a forge, red-dot-hot liquid steel flowed freely, and the base of a four-dot-feet sword was lying inside quietly. The dwarf who was working on it solemnly took out the base, but at an agonizing speed. The moment the base was out, booms were heard, and smoke sizzled. 
even the air was howling at its scalding temperature. When the base had finally shown itself, its surface that had been hammered many times was showing signs of overlapping, but it was crude compared to a finished product. The dwarf took it with his tongs and whispered to it, not unlike a lover to their partner. A moment later, he placed it on his anvil with his tongs in one hand, and his hammer in the other. He took a deep breath before raising his hammer, and then he swung it down on the base. Sparks hit his body that was drenched in oil and sweat, giving him a crimson sheen, and he looked like a god licked by flames. Roy snapped out of it and scanned the whole hull. Weapons and armor were being made during every passing moment. And then black tongs immersed them in water, and steam billowed, filling the hall with smoke. Their movements were boring and repetitive, but there was an inexplicable rhythm to it. The rhythm breathed life into the items it created, giving them a special gleam. I can understand your feelings. I'm a dwarf, and even I was entranced by what I saw when I first came here. The forge is our pride, for it is the place where the best blacksmiths in the Mahakams and Mount Carbon come to work. It's where the best weapons and armor in the north are created. The blacksmiths run on a shift system, and ores are supplied from the mines nearby, while the flames burn forever. The items that are created are sent to many nations, including Edirn, Tamiria, Kedwin, and Redania. We're neutral. We don't take sides, nor do we oppress others, Kerwin said, bragging, and the crossbowmen raised their heads with pride. Roy was speechless from his shock. The blacksmiths work around the clock. The number of things they make in a day must be off the charts. How many elite soldiers can they make? If their population had been large enough, the whole of the northern land would have been theirs. The wine cellars right under. Not that I'm bragging or anything, but if all the barrels down there were to break at the same time, the wine alone would be enough to create a river. But there's no time for a visit today. It's getting late, and Elder Brovar is waiting for you, that he invited them to go forward, and they arrived at a door that was flanked by spiral staircases at the end of the hall. Kerwin waved the crossbowman away before opening the golden door, and then he took Letho and Roy's weapons away. Behind the door stood two axemen that glared at anyone who came in. When they saw who it was, they kept their axes, revealing a path that was lit up by flames. Pillars with complex engravings supported the chamber, and the red carpet in the center extended to the end of the room. On the top of the short staircase stood a dwarf with a golden crown, and his eyes were on Letho and Roy. Join our Discord to chat about the series and get notified when a new chapter gets released. Chapter 54 You are listening at NovelFull.audio Reaper Scans Chapter 54 The Offer of the Elder, T.L. Osaka, P.R. Ash, behind the black, metal throne stood a gigantic, stone statue that was as tall as the chamber. The dwarf that sat on the throne placed his right elbow on the golden armrest and rested his chin on his right hand. His sturdy body was covered in red silk, and his forehead was creased by a frown. His face was majestic, but his eyes had a hint of frustration and lethargy. The dwarves in white who were beside him whispered, Elder Brovar, the people you requested are here. Kerwin bowed to Brovar when he went up to him. Letho, a witcher of the Viper School and his disciple, Roy. It's rare my nephew would praise someone so much, so I guess you're the real deal. I hope you won't disappoint me. The elder's voice echoed in the corridor. It was a husky voice, as if a boulder and stone were scratching against each other. There was an inexplicably ancient element to his voice that left a deep impression. Brovar was a muscular dwarf, but it couldn't hide his age. Dwarves had a long life expectancy, but even so, Brovar was old among them. Brovar Hoger age. 190.8 years old gender. Male HP 120, racial trait. Resilience. Plus 20 HP, status. Great Elder of Mount Carbon, an overwhelming majority of the dwarves acknowledge him. He is the ruler of Mount Carbon and oversees all business pertaining to the Mahakams. Strength. 10, strong body. Plus 1, dexterity. 6, 
Stout Point 1, Constitution. 10, Strong Body. Plus 1, Perception. 7, Will. 8, Spirit. 6, Charisma. 6, Stout Point 1, Skills. Ancient Crafting Level 10. Brovar Hoger has trained his skills for a century. He can create any weapon or armor. Masterful is understating his skills. He can create powerful armor out of scrap metal. Even though it has been years since he has made his last piece of work, his skill is still among the best in the world. Any armor he makes is tantamount to a legacy item usable by any knight, soldier, mercenary, or witcher. He can even create divine items from the ancient era as long as he has the blueprint and materials. 2.Handed Mastery Level 10 Years of training and battle granted him perfect mastery of giant axes, lances, pole arms, and great hammers. Using 2.Handed weapons grants him a 50% damage increase. Resilience, Passive Dwarves live long lives and possess powerful life forces. An adult dwarf has 20 more HP than humans. Strong body, passive. Dwarves are known for their proficiency with two-dot-handed weapons and great stamina. An adult dwarf has one point more in strength and constitution than humans. Stout, passive. Their stout, fat bodies make them move slower than normal humans. Their looks are undesirable by every other race. Some even despise dwarves for their looks. Their dexterity and charisma are deducted by one point. Danger Sensing Level 5 Years of combat experience has granted him a sharp sense toward impending danger. Brovar had higher stats than most people, but Roy had seen better, so he wasn't phased. Ancient crafting caught his attention, though. Letho needs a good silver sword. This dwarf here could be the key to getting it. Letho looked at Kerwin, who was still kneeling, and he announced, Elder Brovar, we have come here as you have wished, but pardon my frankness. You're an influential figure in the Mahakams, and we'd have come to meet you as long as you'd have called for us. There was no need to bring us in like criminals. What did I tell you, Kerwin? Brovar said, and the arrogant Kerwin stared down quietly, admitting his mistake. Forget it. I know you hate dealing with humans, but handling business with your personal bias is unacceptable. Apologize to our guests right away. Kerwin took a deep breath, clenching his fists, and he bowed to them reluctantly. My nephew has been an arrogant one, but he's not even sixty yet. If we go by human standards, he's just grown up. I hope you'll let it slide. Heh. He sounds like he's criticizing his nephew, but he obviously spoils him. Roy looked at them both and realized they looked alike. Their beard and hair were white and their features were similar, especially the arrogance in their eyes. Letho stopped pushing his luck. Let's talk business then, Elder Brovar. Why did you summon us in such a hurry? You should know that witchers deal with monsters. Mount Carbon is an impregnable fortress that's under your supervision. Not even a single monster can get through. I don't see where the problem is. Incorrect, Witcher. Yes, monsters aren't any trouble, but only if you're in the fortress, he said solemnly. Miners have been dying in the mines, outside the fortress. The reason you're here today is to get the murderer, dead or alive. Letho and Roy looked at each other in surprise. That's the same request Cassius asked us to take. Well, looks like we can't escape this. Roy wondered why the seemingly superior dwarves were doing everything to ask for a witcher's help so they could aid the humans at the mountain base. Brovar knew what they were thinking, and he showed anger. The murderer crossed the line. Not only did it kill the human miners, it also started killing my brethren too. That's a declaration of war on me and the whole of the Mahaka Mountains. It must die. I see. Roy realized what was happening. So the villagers knew nothing about this. The humans weren't the only ones who died. Their boss died too. Witcher, you shall be duly rewarded if you can arrest the murderer. What if I can't? 
then you shall go back the same way you came. And the Mahakam shall forever be closed to the both of you. Roy gritted his teeth, and Letho's face fell. Brovar suddenly pushed himself up and bellowed, you ought to know that a treasure can only be gifted to someone worthy. I've made countless weapons, and some of them still have no owner. If you manage to finish the request, I'll give you one of the swords I made. Don't worry about the quality. I shall not insult a witcher. Letho looked interested. Any sword wielder must have heard of the quality of Mahakaman weapons, and the weapons made by Brovar were the best of the best. Having one would be of great help in future battles. Elder, I might only be a disciple, but I can work perfectly with Letho. I can help too. Roy was tempted by the offer, but Brovar didn't share his opinion. You. He shook his head cryptically. I think you should stay here, boy. You'll be well fed, Binoel. I'm Roy sighed. So even the dwarves think I'm weak. He could be of use too, though. Even though close quarter combat was out of his league, he could shoot some bolts and throw a few bombs. Roy winked at Letho, but Letho ignored him. I'll take the request, Elder Brovar. The boy will be staying here. Please take care of him. Brovar nodded, then he told Kerwin, Kerwin, from today onward, you shall listen to Letho's every order and help him track down the murderer. Any objections shall be punished severely. Yes, sir, the silent Kerwin finally replied. Letho, your investigation starts tomorrow, and it shall last for two weeks. If you fail to complete the request by December, I am afraid you must leave the Mahakams. Join our Discord to chat about the series and get notified when a new chapter gets released. Chapter 55 You are listening at NovelFull.audio Reaper Scans Chapter 55 Special Mission, TL Osaka, PR, Ash, after Kerwin had gotten his orders, he'd led Letho and Roy out of the resplendent chamber and into the guest rooms on another floor. You're going to leave me behind again, Letho. Roy tried to persuade him. Don't you think battling this kind of monster is valuable experience for me? It's fine if I just watch from the sidelines. I won't be a burden, trust me. We've refused the request once in Svanther, but in the end, we couldn't escape it. Don't you think this is a sign from fate? Roy talked about fate after not getting any reply. Letho seemed to like anything related to fate. Fate is telling us to face this challenge together. Shut it. Fate doesn't have time for a kid from a village like you. Letho kept his eyes on Kerwin, and without even turning around, he answered, the hunt's going to take us deep into the forest, and that's its turf. Everything is its eyes and ears, so there's no place to hide. Watching from the sidelines isn't going to happen. Letho raised his voice on purpose. So give it up and stay in Mount Carbon. Go on a vacation and stroll around. Not everyone has the chance to visit this magnificent fortress. You've been training your shots, and the dwarves here are experts. You can ask them to teach you if you have the chance. Read my notes if you're bored out of your mind. Roy stopped insisting after Letho stood his ground. Letho got one point right though. He was willing to compete with the dwarven crossbowman, since he just bought a new crossbow, and he was raring to go. They went up the spiral staircase that led to the second floor with Kerwin in front of them. As if struck by lightning, Kerwin served Letho and Roy quietly after getting scolded by Brovar. He brought them to the space above Brovar's chambers, which was another clearing in the mountain. When the door was opened, they were greeted by a corridor filled with doors on both sides leading to exhibition rooms and storerooms, and sconces hung on the wall. When they looked up, they saw a steel door with a rectangular observation hole at the end of the corridor. Roy suddenly felt the howling winds and freezing chill that came from the steel door's observation hole, and he shivered. There's windows here. When he went up to the door, Roy craned his neck and was shocked by what he saw. Whoa, the dwarves sure have an eye for exquisite stuff. The room behind the steel door was of standard size, and it was empty. There was no wall at the end of the room. 
It was completely open, and snow flew in along with the cold gale, freezing the ceiling, walls, and floor. So, open air resort, eh? And with snow to boot. The guest would only have to walk a few steps to see the majesty of Mount Carbon up close, feeling the primal charm of the snow dot capped mountain. They could enjoy the view of the endless pine trees and the flaming sunset among the ivory lands. Well, they'll have to make sure they don't freeze to death in the first place. There weren't any blankets or fireplaces in the room. Only races with hairy bodies and high resistance to cold could enjoy the view. Oh, if they take a few more steps, they can fall down the cliff and die. What do you think, boy? Make one mistake in the Mahakams, and you'll be in there for a week. Want me to make the arrangements for you? Kerwin asked snarkily as he drifted to Roy. Roy turned around and stared down at the dwarf, who only reached his chest, and he squinted. I'm sorry, Mr. Kerwin. Who were you calling a boy? Kerwin's face fell, but he was reminded of Brovar's orders, and he snorted. After making a few turns and arriving at the guest rooms in the depths of the corridor, Kerwin tossed them two keys. Dinner will be sent to you. Lights off at ten, and stay in your room. Not even the Great Elder can save you if you barge into forbidden places. And I'll be waking you tomorrow, Letho. He slammed the door shut. Roy stretched his arms. Too many things happened that day, and he was overwhelmed. He needed time to process it. Letho put his index finger to his lips before tiptoeing to the door. Once he confirmed the coast was clear, he beckoned Roy. Know why I didn't let you join because I'd be deadweight. That's the main reason. Give it to me straight, Letho. Roy took a deep breath. I noticed it. You were misleading him, weren't you? When you raised your voice. Good. Looks like the winds didn't freeze your brain. I do have a mission for you. Hmm, Roy sat up. I knew it. Strength is everything here, but sometimes, you need brains to pull something off. Letho whispered, you'll be investigating the dwarves while I'm away on the hunt. I need you to find a dwarf with a special mark on them. He drew a strange symbol where a spider's web and antler overlapped. Remember this mark. Tell me immediately if you see it on any part of any dwarf. And don't get caught. Roy rubbed his chin and frowned. Everyone's wrapped up in layers of clothes. It's winter, you know. How should I even check their bodies? What if the mark's on their butt? Can't ask me to pull their pants down, can you? That's up to you. Letho patted his shoulder. You did well in the house of Cardell, boy. Use your advantage here. Roy sat on the bed and thought about it, and then he came up with a plan. Try keeping this mission a secret. Don't let them catch you, he warned Roy sternly. But if you find anyone trustworthy here, getting some help is fine. As long as they don't have the mark. I have another question. Roy asked, what if the target's a woman? The people who'd go into the forest and come into contact with the less hen are men. They're your prime targets. Letho paused. If the target isn't among the men, then go for the women. You're young, and you look cleaner than the dwarven children. I don't think the women would complain even if you do anything. Roy thought about the hairy, bearded women, and a chill ran down his spine, but not because of the cold. He shook his head, praying that the target was not a woman. What does that mark mean? The note doesn't have anything about it. Letho licked his lips. All right, listen. The stronger a monster is, the more land it occupies. This monster's hunting grounds range from Spanther to the valley near Mount Carbon. It must be incredibly old, and incredibly strong. Or at least, I've never encountered that kind of monster before. I have to prepare for the worst. It's awakened a spell that's related to the mark. It can take the mark's host's life force, and revive on the spot even if I kill it, so you have to find the bearer of the mark. And the bearers submitted to it, so they're probably a slave now. You must not get caught, 
at any costs. Roy trembled, and the image of a gigantic monster with antlers, white skull, algae on its body, and gnarly limbs appeared in his mind. So, it is a less hen. Join our Discord to chat about the series and get notified when a new chapter gets released. Chapter 56 You are listening at NovelFull.audio Reaper Scans Chapter 56 Mission Start, TL Osaka, PR, Ash, L.C. Less hens were creatures that came after the conjunction of the spheres, and they lived in mountains and forests. They had wild beasts as companions, and they could summon them anytime, anywhere. They could also control plants, and because of their special appearances, ignorant villagers formed a religion around them, worshipping them, and they even made sacrifices. But most folklore told of Leshen's kindness. They guide lost travelers and save people from bandits. Roy had to say that. The knowledge he gained from books wasn't as fascinating as the authentic accounts of a witcher. You subscribe to that nonsense, boy. Less hands slowly suck the life force out of everything in its territory until nothing is left. But they won't attack humans by their own volition, right? No absolutes, remember. Some coexist with humans on the surface, but some see humans as their mortal enemies. Letho seemed to dread facing a less hen. The less hen residing in the Mahakams is an ancient one. I'd say it must have altars in the forest that strengthen it. My job from tomorrow on is to destroy the altars one by one to weaken the less hen. Roy started worrying for Letho. The less hen seemed to be stronger than he'd anticipated. Are you sure you can kill it? Steel weapons won't work on less hens, right? The oils, bombs, and potions are here. Now it's in the hands of fate, Letho said somberly. If I don't manage to come back, leave the Mahakams and find a way to rendezvous with Ox and Serret. They'll continue your training. Roy stopped breathing for a moment. It sounds like he's going to die. Why don't we leave right now and take the long route through Rivia and Upper Sodden? You think you can enter and leave this place as you please? Mount Carbon is not an inn. Letho shook his head. Brovar won't let us leave unless I've met the less hen. The servant sent their dinner that night. Even though the fortress was extravagant, its living conditions were worse than Seville's residence in Aldersburg. Aside from two beds, an oil lamp, and an old clock, there was nothing else in the bedroom. Luckily, the place wouldn't be too hot or too cold no matter the time of the year, just like a cave. The dinner wasn't too bad either. Two portions of charred grilled meat, frozen bread filled with icicles, frozen fruits, nuts, and honeyed wine. It was, interesting, to say the least. Roy gave half of his meat to Letho. Have a bit more, Letho. This could be your last supper. Before Letho's face fell, Roy added, Oh, I'm joking. But there's no point in going to Sintra if you aren't coming with me. I'd rather travel to Novigrad and run the business with my parents. Roy paused, clenched his fists, and resolve gleamed in his eyes. You led me on this path, Letho, so see through it. Letho stopped chewing before continuing calmly. When Roy exited meditation the next morning, Letho was rubbing oils on his sword and short swords, his gaze unbelievably tender, as if he were looking at his lover. He was a muscular man, but his hands moved swiftly, precisely. The gray cloth had a patch of yellowish dot brown substance on it, and for some reason, there was strength in Letho's movement when he wiped his sword. Roy watched the whole process. A row of items were laid out before the Witcher. They were his potions, decoctions, oils, and bombs. Same old. This is for you. Just in case. Keep it safe. Letho handed Roy a small blue bottle with yellow rubber bands around it. What bomb is this? Roy was delighted. He could still remember the effects of Dancing Star back in the fight against the Child Hunter. A Dimerician bomb. It can stop the less hen from casting its spell. Equally effective against witchers and sorcerers. Anything else? 
Letho pointed at another item and explained patiently, this here is relict oil. Increases damage against less hens. Same oil I applied to my sword. The green one is the devil's puffball. Trips the less hen up. Kerwin came for Letho not long after, though he still looked sullen. Roy was taken by Sanchez on a tour around Mount Carbon. Mount Carbon had no use for useless dwarves, so everyone had a job. There were blacksmiths, winemakers, hunters, supervisors, those who took care of the residents' daily lives, and more. If we were to liken Mount Carbon to a nation, Brovar would be the king, while the other elders would be the ministers. Sanchez was one of the servants under the command of the king. He took care of the guests and other elders' daily lives. He wore a white robe, had his hair and beard tied up nicely, and his face was well kept. Compared to the other dwarves, he was more feminine and elegant. Roy glanced at his lower body as they walked together. The beard still full. I wonder if the eunuch here is castrated like in other nations. Kerwin led you around the forge yesterday, so I'll be taking you to the wine cellar. You can have a taste of our wine. How does that sound? Roy shrugged. Put the wine aside. Tell me more about Mount Carbon's situation. Sanchez nodded. As they went on, he explained softly, I don't think I need to explain what's going on in the first floor and basement. The second floor is the blacksmith's dwellings, storerooms, and jails. Third floor is the elders' dwellings. The forts outside the main one are where the guards and supervisors stay. What about the other miners and their families? Where do they live? You should have seen them on your way here. They live in the caves in the mountain. How many residents do you guys have? Roy asked. Sanchez only smiled. Roy asked another question. Do the miners and hunters live nearby? Sanchez thought it was a weird question to ask, but he said yes. There's no way I can check everyone, so the first thing I have to do is narrow down my scope. The only dwarves who would go into the forest are hunters or miners, which means one might have come into contact with the less hen and been marked. The women, blacksmiths, and winemakers live inside. I don't think they'd have the chance to venture into the forest. His first order of business was to focus on the hunters and miners. Let's forget about the wine. The valley's too cold for me. Can you take me to the bathhouse? I need to take a hot shower to warm myself up. Sanchez thought it was weird for Roy to shower that early in the morning, but he said nothing. Of course. Come with me, please. Join our Discord to chat about the series and get notified when a new chapter gets released. Chapter 57 You are listening at NovelFull.audio Reaper Scans Chapter 57 Reunion in the Bathhouse, TL Osaka, PR, Ash, Ah, that's the spot. Steam rose from the bath, and Roy leaned against the sides, resting his eyes. Mount Carbon was freezing, but coal and firewood were abundant. Water was too, so the bathhouse ran around the clock. The blacksmiths, guards, and miners would hop into the hot bath after a day's work to wash away their grime and fatigue. It was around nine o'clock. Aside from Roy, only a few dwarves who just got off from the graveyard shift were in the bath. They covered themselves in towels, but the towels couldn't hide their round bellies, muscular arms, and hairy chests. If Roy ignored their faces, he would have thought he was sharing a bath with gorillas. Roy, on the other hand, had smooth skin and looked fairer than the dwarves, who were mostly dark. Because of that, the dwarves would glance at him from time to time. If it weren't for the fact they were straight, Roy would have scampered off. Even so, he tightened his towel and listened closely. The pair of dwarves near him started gossiping about him. Is that a human boy? There's no hair on his chest, nor does he have a beard. There's nothing manly about him. In fact, he's ugly. He proudly caressed his beard that was floating on the water. Human males are hairless pups. None of our women would fancy them, but that's not an excuse to let your guard down. 
they've never stopped eyeing our women, but we won't let them get away with it. All right, shut up. Daya want to get slammed in the prison. He's Elder Brovar's guest. And an esteemed one at that. Roy was unsure about how to feel after hearing that. His view on aesthetics were that of a human's, so there was no way he'd be interested in female dwarves who had beards and were as buff as bulls. He'd rather have a sorceress. So the rumors are true. Male dwarves are inexplicably paranoid and always worry about their women getting kidnapped by evil outsiders. Probably has something to do with their birth rate. It's super low, and the women who are supposed to bear the children are invaluable resources for everyone in Mount Carbon. As he let his mind wander, Roy stole some glances at the dwarves. He couldn't stare at them openly in case they took it the wrong way. The dwarves in the bath had strong hips, sturdy bodies, big legs, and strong shoulders. And something long hung between their crotches. These guys may be short, but one part of them isn't. I wonder who the less hen marked. Roy glanced back and forth for a few minutes, but it was torture for him. He shook his head. I'm going to get traumatized if this keeps up. Gotta take a break. Looking at hotties would be a treat, but facing stout dwarves was nothing short of getting subjected to torture. About an hour later, Roy felt a gust of wind blow behind him, and the sounds of footsteps neared. What came next was like a scene of horror to him. B. Bennett, U. O. Oaf. D. Did you get F. Fatter? Why. You're going to be. Become a pig. A. A. T. This rate. Barney, you retard. Did you just insult the shield of Mount Carbon? I challenge you to a duel. Oi, who you calling a retard, you fucker? Only we get to call him that. You want a taste of this knuckle sandwich, you fuck. The towels were off, and the naked dwarves got into a brawl. Chest slammed against chest, bats swung against bats, and wieners. Well, let's just say they had a sword fight. You're a barbaric retard Maki took from the wilds, shithead. Why dot you're just a l dot little shit a squirrel shitted, fucker. Why dot you're so thirsty you f dot fuck reindeers e dot every night. Retard. D dot damn it Barney was exhausted from the fight on more levels than one. He wiped the sweat off his head and turned around. What he saw shocked him. H dot hey, boss, t dot that guy looks f. Familiar. Roy started sweating when he heard the familiar stuttering. Curse my luck. I just have to bump into them here of all places. He closed his eyes and slid underwater. The footsteps stopped behind him, and he felt ripples around him. As the water splashed, one buff dwarf came into the bath. Barney pulled him out of the water with enthusiasm, his eyes wide. I doubt it's you. You got the wrong person, mate. Barney's face was red from excitement, but he couldn't say anything no matter how much he tried. All right, stop teasing him. Reagan Dalba and his companions entered the bath. He sounded annoyed about what Roy had done. A moment later, the four dwarves surrounded Roy, their eyes solely on him, their breathing heavy. We'll settle this later, Bennett. Don't think you've won, the dwarf shouted at the guy they were fighting against earlier. Scared, you coward. Fuck off. The dwarves found themselves kissing their companions and were in each other's arms when they regained consciousness. Shocked, they checked their bodies, but nothing was wrong. Still, it was a humiliating experience. When they saw the perpetrator in the bath, they let the personal grudge slide first. You're Roy, aren't you? To think we thought you a friend. I think you owe us an explanation. Roy forced a smile and shifted the topic. That was awesome of you guys. Those weaklings stood no chance against you. If they'd tried to escape even a moment later, they would have been messed up, but a dot at least you have taste. Roy, just because you're the elder's guest doesn't mean you can do anything you want. Reagan waved his excited companions down. The wine's great, though we could do without the extra ingredient. It is 50.year.old Mahakaman liquor. 
Reagan licked his lips, reminiscing the taste of the wine. But you have to return my crossbow to me. That's my brother's gift, and it's special to me. You're too weak to use it anyway. Reagan, I'm sorry about your loss, but it's not here. You can search anywhere you want, even the bedroom. Reagan kept quiet. B. Boss, I. I'm not taking T. This anymore. Why don't we beat him to a pulp? Roy frowned, thinking if he should give the weapon back, since he did feel guilty about taking something of great sentimental value to someone. So it seems you're taking my treasure away no matter what, Roy. Reagan cupped some hot water and splashed it on his arm. Fine. We'll settle this with Mount Carbon's custom, then. Mount Carbon's custom. Gwent, weapons, and wine. They're what we love the most. We hold three matches if we ever come across anything that can't be settled with a conversation. Reagan continued. The one who wins two out of three matches gets to keep the crossbow. So a duel then. Roy changed his mind. Since he didn't see the mark on them, that meant the dwarves were innocent. Gaining allies out of them would be good for Roy since staking out at the bathhouse alone would be too inefficient. Having helpers would go a long way, though he still had the chills at the thought of their naked bodies. Ah, so you do have it. Reagan laughed. Don't worry, it won't be a four-on-one. We won't stoop so low against an outsider. It's a one-dot-on-point one duel for a total of three matches. We can start right away if you're fine with it. The warm bathhouse is perfect for Gwent. Roy smacked a beautiful deck on the side of the bath, and he grinned in excitement. Since they're going to do this, I have no reason to hold back. I don't lose when it comes to Gwent. Come. Reagan and his companions looked at one another weirdly. Get the board, Drew. All right, we're counting on you now, Dave. Just win like you usually do. Get everything from him. Join our Discord to chat about the series and get notified when a new chapter gets released. Chapter 58 You are listening at NovelFull.audio Reaper Scans Chapter 58 Teach, TL Osaka, PR, Ash, put your back into it. Yeah, that's the spot. Roy sat in the bath, getting massaged gently by the stuttering dwarf, Barney. Barney was smiling sycophantically as he massaged Roy. H. How does T. That feel now? Not bad. You can probably start a career as a professional masseur here. W. What about my D. Debt then? Later. You're not going to run away from it. Barney wiped his sweat off. Never in his life had he seen someone play Gwent like Roy had. The boy would always come up with the most surprising tactics every time, catching his opponent off guard. Even Dave, one of the top 10 players in Mount Carbon, lost 10 rounds, giving Roy the first win. Barney didn't believe that was happening, and he wanted to take revenge. But he was too stupid to play, and after his continuous losses, Barney had racked up a debt that amounted to 30 crowns. That was his salary for the whole month. Dot Reagan was in the bath beside Barney, and he shivered after overhearing the conversation, feeling insulted. Don't look down on us, boy. Barney's not a deadbeat. We might be a grumpy bunch, but we have something humans don't, hot looks, manliness, loyalty, and integrity. Okay, that's technically four things, but that's not the point. Point is, anyone who tries to be a deadbeat will live their lives in shame. Roy nodded in approval. He'd heard of the Mahakaman dwarves' loyalty. Even though they loved their crowns, they wouldn't abandon their friends, and they held their promises. Zoltan Chivi was a prime example of how a dwarf would risk his life for his friends. And thanks to their integrity, dwarves ran a lot of good businesses. Cianfinelli, Giancardi, and Vivaldi were the top dwarven families in the banking world. All the biggest cities like Vizima, Beauclair, Vengerberg, Novigrad, Dragon Mountains, and even Blue Mountain, had their banks. They had business in almost every city in the north. It was because of that Roy went along with the rules. 
if his opponents were either human or elf, he'd be denied his winnings in the same circumstances. You won the first match, Roy. Do you have the guts to continue this in the archery range? Is that a challenge I hear? I accept it. It's still early anyway. Roy had always wanted to see a dwarven crossbowman in action. They changed into their clothes, but before they left, Roy stopped Barney. Barney, I can waive this debt if you do me a favor. I doubt I'll do it. Barney was obviously excited about the opportunity. Thirty crowns was a big amount for him. Stay here and tell everyone who comes to go to the archery range. Remember this. Barney wondered why Roy would make that request, but he didn't argue. Instead, he agreed to it readily. They went out of the bathhouse, walked across the plaza, and journeyed to the range behind the main fortress. Suddenly, Roy had a feeling he was being watched, and he frowned. But when he looked behind him, nobody was there. It was already morning, and dwarves were already going about their business. The males were wearing thick, dirty coats and holding their mining implements as they went to the mine outside. The females were holding gigantic containers on their heads, going to and from the marketplace in the plaza's corner. Not every dwarf had a long beard. Most of the males were bushy, and less than 20% of the females were as hairy as the males. Some looked decent, but they were still stout nonetheless. Not my type. Reagan, if I'm right, working in the mountains isn't very lucrative, is it? He thought all the dwarves would be filthy rich, since they had a treasure trove beneath their feet, but the Gwent matches told him otherwise. Exactly, Reagan answered without fear. Most dwarves only make around 60 crowns a month. Wine and gear maintenance takes a cut, and we're left with not much money to spend. What about the dwellings? Are they expensive? Roy cast his gaze to the caves. How long do you have to save up for one? Ah, that's where you're wrong, my friend, Reagan replied proudly. We don't have to spend a crown on our caves. The elders give every adult dwarf a cave free of charge, but it'll be taken back if the owner leaves the mountain without permission. Roy was envious of it. The elders go to great lengths to preserve the population, huh? Are there many dwarves who try to make a living in the outside world then? No, but there are some who do it every year. Eventually, they arrived at the fighting plaza. It was a fenced space, albeit a gigantic one, and it was divided into a few parts. At the end of the plaza was the archery range, and there were targets carved into humanoid shapes. There was also a weapons training center filled with racks of weapons, as well as a fenced ring used for close combat matches. There were twenty dwarves occupying a certain training center, engaging themselves in their daily practice. They were wearing padded armor and swung their weapons as per the instructor's order. The dwarves might have been stout, but they swung the two-dot-handed weapons like they were feathers, and Roy could see that the strength was not to be underestimated. They were like moving fortresses, for their armor could block any arrows, and the heavy weapons turned their weakness into a strength. If they were to engage in close-quarter combat, Roy would lose in a matter of seconds. His combat abilities were shit. Roy didn't have many things to rely on in combat. His best bet was long dot range shooting with his crossbow, but even though his accuracy was bolstered by perception, his shots weren't powerful enough, and that was including massacre and crossbow mastery's increased damage. If he shot anywhere else aside from his enemy's face, the damage he dealt would be negligible. His effective range was also a weakness. In most cases, he could make perfect shots within a 100 feet range, but if his enemy was outside that range, the wind would affect his shot too much. He needed training, and Reagan, whose crossbow mastery was level 5, was the perfect example to learn from. The targets in the archery range were placed at different distances. Once everyone had come in, Reagan raised his hand to feel the air for a moment. This guy checks the wind speed and direction with the hairs on his hand. Archery's best done on breezy days, or one without wind. Come, my friend. Show me what you got. I want to see if your archery skills are as great as a witcher's sword fighting. 
Reagan borrowed two identical crossbows and tossed one to Roy, while he held the other one. You're young, and your hands aren't that calloused. I can see it hasn't been long since you've started training. There'll be no time limit, then. Reagan puffed out his chest confidently. We'll start with the target 30 feet away, and then you'll move to the right for the next one, but the distance will increase. We get 10 shots each, and the one who manages to land the most shots wins. Deal. Roy hesitated, and he nodded. I'll go first. Do as you wish. The crossbow and bolts Reagan handed him were made to dwarven standards. The bow was four feet long, a lot bigger than Roy's Gabriel, and it was heavier too. The crossbow was made of pine wood, and it was a deep brown due to repeated usage. The draw weight was 60 pounds, making it slightly difficult for Roy to reload the crossbow. Roy started with the target 30 feet away. He held the crossbow with his left hand, his right index finger docked on the trigger, and he took a standing stance. Roy took a deep breath, then raised his crossbow, aiming at the target using his right eye. Then he heaved a sigh, and in that split second, the crossbow had just been lowered to eye level, and he fired his shot. The bolt pierced through the air and slammed into the target 30 feet away, embedding itself deeply into the bullseye thanks to the crossbow's strength. Reagan didn't look surprised, while Roy heaved a sigh. He swung his slightly numb arm and prepared for the second shot. After that, he kept on shooting, and he hit the bullseye for the 60 dot feet, 90 dot feet, and the 100 dot and point 20 dot feet target. The continuous shooting was taking a toll on Roy's forearm and legs. Since the crossbow was much heavier than the one he normally practiced with, he wasn't used to it. He never had a chance to compete with someone during his training, and when he finally got the chance, his opponent was Reagan. That had lit the flames within him, but the next few shots had doused it out. He was slightly off dot target for the 100.50 dot feet target, and more so for the following one. The next one was even worse, and he was almost out at the eighth target. He missed the shot for the ninth target, and the same thing happened for the tenth. Sweat was trickling down his cheek when he was done, and he looked despondent because of his missed shots. All right, that's it. Your accuracy isn't bad, and your pose is standard. You've received some formal training, but it hasn't been for too long. I have some advice for you. Just what I wanted. Reagan seemed to change into another dwarf when he held the crossbow. He hunched his back slightly and squatted a bit, his gaze sharp. He quickly took out a light bolt from his quiver and loaded his crossbow, and then he fired his shot. His movements were swift and clean, without a single unnecessary move in between. Roy kept quiet since he realized Reagan was at least twice as fast as him during the reload. Reagan's standing position looked similar to Roy's but upon closer inspection, there were a few differences. Pay attention to the crossbow. Reagan leaned forward and aimed. Roy took a step back to observe the dwarf and the crossbow. Three quarters. The crossbow was positioned between the dwarf's collarbone and neck, around the three-quarter mark of his body. That was different from Roy's positioning, and Reagan adjusted his stance to one that fit better with his style. Roy couldn't make those adjustments at his level. Reagan was fast and stable, and he easily fired three shots that hit the bullseye. Do you have your own crossbow? I do. I don't see it on you, he grumbled before pulling the trigger and hitting the bullseye of the 2.100.10 dot feet target. A good crossbowman keeps his crossbow at his side at all times, even when he's eating or sleeping. A bit of tenderness welled up in his eyes, as if he were reminded of his lover, but even so, that didn't affect his shot. You have to build up rapport with it, knowing it's every nook and cranny. You need to know every inch of it even with your eyes closed. The more you know, the faster you can be in battle. Reagan was almost whispering, and he kept on shooting with incredible speed. Roy almost couldn't see him aiming, and Reagan had already shot all the shots. All of them hit the bullseye, making Reagan the undisputed winner. Roy had no arguments about that. 
Reagan's perception was on the same level as his, so Reagan couldn't see the targets clearer, but his control over the crossbow was vastly superior. You have to take care of your crossbow like it's your arm. A good weapon is a crossbowman's most important thing. Take good care of it. Reagan took a bottle of grease and rubbed the contents on every inch of the crossbow. In most cases, a Mahakaman crossbow can last you a few years, but there's one condition. You must keep up its maintenance for every hundred shots you fire. Don't misfire or take too long to reload. It'll cause unnecessary damage and shorten its lifespan. If you don't maintain it, it'll cost you your life if it breaks on the battlefield. Roy took that advice to heart. No wonder Letho does that to his weapons after every battle. I didn't pay any attention to it before, but now I will. Reagan's advice benefited him a lot. If Crossbow Mastery had an EXP bar, Roy could probably level it up a lot after listening to Reagan. Roy was reminded of the fact that he never maintained his own crossbow, so he asked for a bottle of maintenance oil from Reagan. And now we're even. Reagan laughed, his depression from the Gwent loss erased. I can't wait for the wine battle. Elder Brovar said you can have all you can drink, yes. Roy nodded in amusement. Ah, so he's going for the free booze. Drew and Dave huddled closer, almost drooling, for wine was one of the things they loved the most. Why don't we hold the third match tomorrow morning? We have to stand sentry from noon to dawn. Roy agreed readily. Sure. Meet up at the bathhouse. He thought it was a bargain to make some friends with free wine. Magnificent. I'm starting to like you, boy. Don't forget to maintain my baby when you go back. I'll kick your arse if you scratch it. All right, boys. Let's get back to the bathhouse to get that dumbass, Barney. Join our Discord to chat about the series and get notified when a new chapter gets released. Chapter 59 You are listening at NovelFull.audio Reaper Scans Chapter 59 Flames, TL Osaka, PR, Ash, the heavy footsteps left deep footprints in the snow. Letho flicked the snow and pine leaves on his shoulder away and looked up at the sparrows who flew away in fear. How much longer till we get there? The dwarf panted and shuffled to Letho, his face red. About half an hour. We found the body under the oldest pine tree, and it's right in front of us. Kerwin looked around nervously. Are you sure it's enough with just the two of us? Why don't we get more people? No. That'd mess everything up. Now tell me about the victim. Give me a minute. You're going really fast. How did that boy keep up with you? Kerwin put his hands on his knees and rested for a bit. He wasn't as harsh when it was only Letho around. In fact, Kerwin treated him with respect. The victim went by the name of Adrian. He's 80, worked as a miner, and had a son and a daughter back in the mountains. Kerwin paused for a moment. The other victims were miners just like Adrian. They were killed on their way back from work. Letho made the bark of the tree beside him rustle. Good job keeping it under wraps. The people in Svanther thought the less hen only claimed four humans. Kerwin smiled bitterly. We have no choice. They won't work if they know that even the dwarves are getting killed. The mines would sustain heavy losses. We have to hide it, or there will be mass hysteria. But that won't last at this rate. Bunch of bloodsuckers. Letho shook his head. And who told the villagers that phantoms did this? No idea, but honestly, I'd prefer that to this. At least phantoms are easier to handle. They crossed the mountain, and the forest's entrance was starting to disappear behind them. Letho, are you pitying those villagers? Letho didn't answer, and Kerwin continued. From what I know, Witchers are heavily discriminated against in human society. They see you guys as monsters no matter how many real monsters you kill for them, or how many lives you save. You're nothing but a lapdog to them. Kerwin emphasized the last sentence and quickly looked at Letho, 
but to his disappointment, Letho showed no change in expression. Spit it out. I know you're trying to tell me something. Very well then. Kerwin shrugged, and he hastened. I think you witchers are like us. We're deviants from those humans. You've been a vagrant for a long time now, taking requests for a living. Haven't you ever thought about settling down? Settling down where? Mount Carbon's a good place. Kerwin heaved a sigh and told him what he thought, you'll find our offer irresistible. Your skills and knowledge alone are great assets. You're trying to recruit me. Letho stopped in his tracks and turned around to look Kerwin in the eyes. Mahakam and Mount Carbon are too boring for me. I like some excitement in my life. And I have to finish a mission, so I can't stay for long. Then Letho continued into the forest. Kerwin was furious about being rejected, but he calmed down quickly. Let's talk about the situation then. Do you have any idea how to settle it? The moment he said that, Letho stopped. He looked back at Kerwin and put his finger to his lips, and then he crouched like a leopard. They'd walked a mile into the forest, and the pine trees were starting to get denser around them, but it was eerily silent. Not even the chirp of a bird or the howling of the wind could be heard. It was as if they were in a graveyard, and chills ran up their spines. Kerwin held his hammer. He had a feeling that the pine trees around them had turned into stiff humans who were staring at them. Kerwin's hands were trembling, but his morale was still high. Letho uncorked a potion with his mouth and gulped everything. The veins on his cheeks blackened and his muscles tensed up, not unlike a beast that was hunting its prey. Watch my back, and I'll watch yours, Letho growled, and he and Kerwin huddled closer. Letho traced a triangle in the air, and a faint green light shone around the triangle, much to Kerwin's shock. And then a magic circle with a twenty feet radius appeared on the snow-capped ground. A moment later, a light yellow shield surrounded Letho. At the same time, howls pierced the air around them, and countless wolves appeared from between the trees. Their fur was gray, their eyes green. Mists swirled around their snouts, and they crouched, howling as they inched closer to the duo. Great Mahakam, what is going on? We've never had such bad luck in our previous investigations. Because it perceives us as a threat. Letho unsheathed his steel sword instead of his short swords. The sword that was covered in oil gleamed menacingly above the snow ground. Letho held it around his waist, his muscles taut. He pointed the blade at the wolves, looking like someone who was going to toil on the field. The wolves howled, and Letho taunted, Come at me. I'm sure your master will be pleased. Infuriated, the wolf pack pounced on him, but they stepped right into the trap of Erden, and a green light shone. The wolves who were caught had their movements slowed. They froze in midair and lost a bit of their agility. Kerwin slammed the wolf who'd leapt at him down, drenching the ground with blood, and the wolf became pulp. Fuck yeah. Kerwin roared, and he lunged forward, his hammer swinging through the air, sending the beasts who pounced at him flying back. Letho fought differently. He crouched, his steel sword beside his waist. He put his left foot forward, and his right foot back. He was poised to fight, and at the first chance of attack, he would dart ahead. When a wolf pounced at him, he sliced upward, burying the blade in the wolf's body. And then he slashed downward before taking another step, slicing a second wolf in half, spilling its innards. He moved his wrist, dislodging the flesh that was stuck to his sword, and then he stepped back into his magical circle, resuming his stance. His plan was to take out the wolves with nothing but stabs and slashes. Every time Letho made an attack, another beast would fall, as if they were taken away by the reaper. They didn't even manage to get close, and corpses were already piling up. The blood splashed on Letho's face made him look more feral. It didn't take long for them to kill five wolves, but compared to the hundreds of beasts around them, it was nothing. Their brethren's deaths enraged the remaining beasts, and their attacks became quicker, almost overwhelming the duo. Shit. Not even the wine cellar has this many rats. 
Kerwin's hair billowed, and he swung his hammer again, sending another one flying. He heaved a sigh and made a hasty step backward, but one of the wolves noticed the opening, and then it tried to chomp down on the dwarf's left leg. But before it could, Letho stabbed it. Still keeping up, chap. I'm fine. Worry about yourself. Kerwin gripped his hammer with trembling hands, and he smashed another wolf to a pulp. Letho scanned the battlefield. All right, there are around twenty or thirty of them here. They'd managed to whittle it down to the number he wanted, and he tossed the canister on his belt into the pack. Then, the bomb exploded twenty feet away from them, and the sound of explosions roared through the forest, the flames engulfing dozens of wolves. The air around them was filled with howls and the scent of burning flesh, while the ground was soaked with blood. More than half the wolves around them had been killed by the explosion alone, and charred corpses fell onto the snow. Some managed to survive, but they scurried back to their pack, their fur still burning. Holy Mahakam, that was a perfect bombing. Kerwin praised, forgetting all about his nerves, but it wasn't the end of it. Dot Letho turned around and drew an art sign in the air, sending the wolves that were pouncing toward him flying back, creating a space between them and the wolves. Then he tossed another bomb, but instead of exploding instantly, the canister smashed into pieces, and white smoke quickly enveloped thirty beasts. He pulled Kerwin closer to him before embedding his sword into the ground and quickly making a sign, and then he pushed it outward. A moment later, flames spread out in a cone, igniting the smoke. The gas that covered the beast started exploding, causing a chain reaction, and then howls and rumbles traveled across the pine forest. A few moments later, the howls got quieter, as most of the wolves had been killed. The remaining survivors ran away with their tails between their legs. Half the wolves were dead, while some were on the verge of death. Only one was standing tall amidst the carnage. When he was sure they were safe, Letho stopped maintaining Quen, and his shield broke into pieces. Join our Discord to chat about the series and get notified when a new chapter gets released. Chapter 60 You are listening at NovelFull.audio Reaper Scans Chapter 60 Totem, TL Asuka, PR, Ash, once they killed the wolves, the duo went on with their mission, though Kerwin kept quiet all the way because of his shock. But when they drew closer to their destination, he finally couldn't keep his curiosity away. Letho, are all witchers this strong? Letho didn't answer, but that only made Kerwin respect him more. They made it through another hill and arrived at the place Adrian died. It was the same scene Letho had seen at the mountain's base. The branches came together to form a spike, and he could smell the stench of beast excrements under the snow. Letho squinted. Kerwin explained. There are eight victims, and they were disemboweled by these spikes. I don't understand why it did this. Does the way its victims die have a special meaning to it? Kerwin asked. But Letho didn't answer the question. According to your testimony, Svanther suffered four deaths, while Mount Carbon had the same number of deaths during the last three months, making it a total of eight. No. It has been four months. The first death was a Mahakaman dwarf. So one victim every fortnight or so. Kerwin pinched his beard. Now that you say it, I think that's the case. Letho heaved a sigh. All right, I have a guess. You'd find a new body after every full moon. Kerwin gasped. Hey, that's right. Letho turned solemn. Then that proves my guess. This is an ancient ritual, a sacrificial one that comes from the other dimension. The killer uses flesh as bait to activate the forest's power. Among the victims, the ones who died on the night of the full moon would create a magical circuit with the previous victim, and the killer would use that to create a permanent totem to strengthen itself. What does that mean? This is the fourth totem. Kerwin was surprised, but only for a moment. So you're saying that the killer's been powered up four times? This is going to be a problem. Letho's face fell. That's why we have to destroy the totems one by one. They're its limbs. 
once we start pulling them out, we'll see how long it'll last. Kerwin thought of another problem. But the forest stretches for hundreds of miles. Finding four totems here is going to be impossible. Not exactly. Since it's making circuits, the totem must be in between two corpses, so you'll have to take me to the nearest crime scene. Kerwin nodded in respect. As expected of a professional. You managed to dig up something we failed to for the past few months, that they left the spot and moved toward the next one. While they were on the way there, Kerwin said, the forest in the Mahakams is filled with beasts. The killer could have used animals as sacrifices, so why did it target humans and ancient races? Lethal was always patient when it came to knowledge about monsters. Humans might fight among themselves, kill their brethren, lie, cheat, steal, and do every evil deed in the books, but they are of a higher class than the beasts. Well, normal beasts, that is. In other words, the magical energy in human flesh is higher than in normal beasts, so of course all the monsters would love it. Kerwin continued his questioning. So now that it has four totems, isn't it at its strongest? If we march right up its totem, it's like we're saying we want to kick its arse. What if it shows up? Won't that be dangerous? Why don't I go and bring some warriors back? Then he thought his cowardice was embarrassing, so he explained, it's safer to have a bigger group. Since we have a lead right now, we don't have to risk our lives any further. Don't worry. Letho stopped. If it shows up and I can't win, we can always run. I'm sure we can outrun it. Besides, if it does show up, it can't stay in the Mahakams any longer, because I'd know where to hunt it, and how to kill it. Also, it's an experienced, ancient, and cunning monster. It won't come out that easily. I doubt I see. Tell me if something comes up so I can prepare myself. They kept walking for another hour, and then it was noon. The snow on the ground was decorated with a few long lines of footsteps, and cold winds howled through the forest, making the dwarf shiver. When his necklace started humming, Letho held it down. Kerwin stood at the ready with his hammer, and he crouched down, ready to fight. But there was nothing around him when he looked around. Where is it? Where's the totem? All he could see was snow and forest. There was nothing like a totem there. Letho went up to a gigantic pine tree and saw a peculiar mark on the big trunk. Antlers and spider webs. What is this? Kerwin huddled closer and mumbled, and Letho went up to another pine tree and smacked it. And then he went for a third, then a fourth. Kerwin saw the same mark on all four pine trees, and then he realized it formed a twenty dot feet square around them. A chill ran up his spine, and he tensed. Are we in some freaky magic circle? Got it. Letho turned his back to Kerwin and looked up, and then he pointed at the sky. Kerwin looked at where he was pointing, and his jaw dropped. What in the holy Mahakams is that? Fifty feet above them, the four pine trees' leaves were squashed together, snow piling above them, blocking out the sunlight. In the center of the trees, a wooden, fusiform stake hung. It looked like a beehive from afar, but it was ancient and decrepit. Holes dotted the stake's surface, as if chewed out by termites. It looked as if a single touch would turn it to ash, and on top of the stake, a single, gnarly antler protruded from a hole. Tiny bones hung from it, forming ancient trinkets. That's. That's, that's the totem. While Kerwin was still in shock, Letho was already standing underneath the totem, raising his hand to estimate the distance between them. Then he blew into his hands and dug away at the ground with his sword. The snow and soil flew everywhere, and then a gigantic antler symbol was revealed on the floor. It glowed an eerie red, looking like a scar on the ground, and it radiated heat. Letho brushed his hand across the mark and commented, This rune here is the core of the totem. Then he made the sign of Igni and shot a stream of fire that expanded conically, burning the mysterious mark. On the other hand, Kerwin was stuttering, holding his hammer as he looked around in confusion. As Letho went on with the burning, 
Kerwin noticed something shocking. Four transparent tentacles appeared from the rune in the center, wriggling and squirming around. Eventually, they slithered into the pine trees that had the weird symbols on them, and then drops of black fluid started flowing from the tree. Eventually, black blood started gushing out of the trees. The burning went on for thirty seconds. When Letho finally stopped casting Igni, a loud pop was heard, and the totem that was hanging in the air fell down. Kerwin went to take a look and noticed that the totem had turned from brown to black, not unlike used charcoal. And it was already starting to turn into ash. Done. Letho heaved an exhausted sigh and sliced the totem. Smoke and ash burst into the air, and a few moments later, the totem disappeared as if it had never been there before. Join our Discord to chat about the series and get notified when a new chapter gets released.